Hey guys, Zom Fox here, and today we are finally doing the Week 1 United Football League Power Rankings. This is my most anticipated video every year for me, because this is the video that truly signifies that we are right next to the start of a spring football season, as we are just five days away from spring football kicking off if you're watching this the day this is released. Because, I mean, look, this offseason has been crazy from the whole merger first announcement of oh, could it be happening to it actually happening and everything since then? It's been pretty crazy. There's been a lot of team shifts over the past couple of weeks, and especially the past couple of months. We saw a bunch of great players get signed to teams, released from teams, to make just a really crazy season. The top to the bottom is nowhere near as far as it was with, let's say, teams like the Vipers and the Defenders last season. The worst team to the best team is a much smaller gap than we've seen before. There still is a gap, which is why we do have a power rankings, but it is nowhere near as bad as it was the past couple of seasons. The fact is that this is going to be a crazy spring football season, and to start off, we're going to be doing the power rankings. Now, we're also going to be doing each team's most surprising cut as well. We saw a lot of great players get signed to teams, but a lot of great players get released. We're going to be talking about some of the biggest surprises, as some of these guys could just sign out of nowhere the next couple days to provide a huge power shift to certain teams. So, without further ado, let's get right on into this. With number 8, the Michigan Panthers. The Michigan Panthers come in at number 8, and I don't think this is really a shock to anybody. This is a team that, once the 8 teams were announced that made it into the Merge League, we all kind of knew this was one of the two worst teams. The fact is, them and the Brahmas were the two clear, obvious, weaker rosters to make it. When you consider the other teams that made it had at least a lot of really solid players, or you could understand, you know, why they'd be good. Them, they weren't the same. But whereas the Brahmas were able to get a huge upgrade in their coaching department during the offseason and were able to get a few players that could help them out, the Panthers, their biggest addition didn't work out. Now, when you look at what they are currently, this is a team that very much is a question mark at a couple areas. Look, the fact is that their big addition was Corey Coleman. He ended up retiring during the offseason, so they lost their number one addition. Now, while they still have a couple great receivers, mainly Devin Gray and Trey Quinn, who are both really solid receivers, neither of them are the same level of a Corey Coleman, which does hurt them a bit. But these are still two solid receivers. But that leads to the issue of EJ Perry. Look, EJ Perry is a very questionable quarterback because of the fact this is a guy that has virtually no film on him. He only played in two games this past season. His first game, he didn't look too good, but he was only there after basically being there a week. His playoff game, he looked incredible. He's very much like Quentin Dormaday, but even more of a question mark. Because at least with Dormaday, he's played almost a full season to where it's now officially, is it him or is it the coaching he had this past season? Whereas with EJ Perry, we just don't know how good he actually is. We don't know if that playoff game was him just, you know, learning the playbook and having no film on him. We don't know if he actually is that good. We don't know. But of course, the other thing with this team is that while they did make it to the playoffs and lose an OT, this is a team that is basically a defense is going to have to do a lot of work. Look, they have a great running back room with West Hills and Matt Colburn, but the fact is that this team runs through Frank Gidna and Breland Speaks, who are two of the best players at their ex respective position. It shouldn't be just the two of them in that front seven as the two huge name guys, but that's because of the surprising cut we'll get to in a second. The fact is the Panthers are the weakest team on paper at the moment. They were virtually fighting back and forth with the Brahmas. With the Brahmas actually signing a really good player and the Panthers cutting a really good player over the past week, it kind of solidified the Panthers at 8. Now, that good player they cut was Gerard Fernandez. Fernandez was an all-USFL linebacker back in 2022. He was incredible. And this past season, while he took a kind of a slight backseat to Vontae Diggs, he was still really good. Look, if you want to be just a stat guy, he was virtually just right behind him in tackles. It was just TFLs and sacks and interceptions, you know, the extracurricular type of stuff that Diggs was able to exceed him in. But the fact is, Fernandez was a huge reason why Diggs was so good. It was because they were a great duo, much like Ruben Foster and Keava Tizino with the Maulers. And everybody expected this to be the duo with Fernandez and Gidna. But for some reason, the Panthers decided to release him. Look, no hate to the Panthers linebackers on their roster, but... Let's be real here. If you're just, you know, if you're an avid fan, are you really saying anyone aside from Gidna that's a linebacker on the Panthers is better than Fernandez? I don't think so. This is a very weird cut. Yes, I know some people might be like, what about Shailen Luani? The fact is his release wasn't too shocking because this is a team that already had a bunch of great safeties. So it kind of, you know, while it still was shocking to see Luani get cut, it made sense. They still had Tornan and guys they had the past season. But Fernandez really didn't make sense. This was definitely the most surprising cut of the team, and one that 
might, you know, really hurt them in the end because of the fact that they don't have that second truly great linebacker, which they would have had with Fernandez. Now, coming in at number seven is going to be the San Antonio Brahmas. Yeah, you could probably guess from how I was talking, this team was going to get seven. This is a team that a lot of people are very high on, but it feels like this is a team that people are high on for purely coaching. When you look at this team, this team has one huge question mark, and that is how good is Quentin Dormanate actually? Look, he still isn't officially the starter, but most people assume he will be, and at worst, he will play a lot at you know the quarterback position for them. The fact is, this is a dude who has shown that he can be truly elite. Of course, you remember the one game the DC Defenders lost during the regular season this past season was to Dormade and the Orlando Guardians, who were 0-6. Dormade had this incredible game against them, and they ended up winning by one point. The issue is, aside from that game, there's a lot of times where he didn't look too great, and a lot of times where he was basically heavily relying on Cody Latimer. Now, of course, there are the questions of, was it coaching? They did not have great coaching, and aside from Latimer, they weren't a super talented team. They had good, good players, but they weren't as talented as, let's say, a St. Louis Battlehawks or Birmingham Stallions. So, the question is how good Dormade actually is. I'm a guy who is in favor of McClendon. I think that McClendon was a very similar situation, an awful overall team, but looked really good. The thing with Dormade is he showed that true upside against the defenders, much like EJ Perry did against the Maulers. But of course, the big reason is Wade Phillips. The main reason people are high on this team isn't really Dormade, it's Wade Phillips, because they view this is a guy that can elevate the roster of the low end. The guys that a lot of people aren't high on, he can elevate. That's basically the hope for them, because on paper, their roster is the weakest in the XFL conference. It's just their head coach has been able to elevate defensive defenses especially to be much better than what you would assume. If he's able to do that, this team could be a legit threat. The issue is, can they? Now, they were able to get some huge help, mainly Tim Ward, during the last week of this offseason because of the fact that the defenders ended up releasing him, and he signed immediately to the Brahmas. That was the easiest reason to move them up to seven. That was a great signing. But of course, the other thing is that this is a team that does have destroying on it. So much like how a lot of the Battlehawks, a lot of their hype and overall expectations is due to their huge fan base, we're seeing that a bit more with the Brahmas. They gained a bunch more of a social media following since they signed him, and they already have a really good punter in Brad Wing. So if destroying is as good as, you know, a lot of people always say he is, this could be a very dominant special teams unit up there with teams like the Showboats for being a really good unit. It's just definitely going to be a question of exactly how well does this defense and offense work. If it all gels, it'll be great. But this is the definition of a team that is just, a lot of people have a lot of hype behind it, but it's a very big risk. This is a team that there's a reason why a lot of the betting odds have them so low, because they are very much a team that on paper isn't nearly as good as the teams above them, but their ceiling, mainly thanks to their great head coach and the fact they do have a quarterback that has shown upside, this team can be really good. Their receiving room is really hoping that Kirkland is able to come back fully healthy and play a full season, which he wasn't able to last year, but we'll see. Overall, I have him at seven. Now, their most surprising cut was Jordan VC. Like I said again, they do have some solid receivers, especially Kirkland, who looked really good the few weeks he played. But the fact is, this is still one of the weaker rooms, and Jordan Vesey was a very solid player this past season. He had almost 300 yards on a team that had a couple truly elite options, mainly Ja'Core Pearson. So this is a guy who could be a very legit tertiary threat, or even on some teams, a good secondary threat. Seeing him get released was a pretty big shock. Not as big a shock as Fernandez, but this was still a bit of a surprise. So we'll see exactly how Smith uses him the guys they have on their offense now, but um, it still is kind of shocking to see VC get released. This is a dude who it looked like was going to be a legit number two on this team. Instead, he got released. We'll see what ends up happening, but this was definitely one of the bigger shocks. Now, coming in at number six is going to be the Houston Roughnecks. This is a very weird team to judge. The Houston Roughnecks are just, they're just weird. That's the easiest way to put it. Look, when you look at them, of course, the thing that sticks out like a sore thumb is Jared Garantino. He is a quarterback that virtually nobody is that excited for. Nobody really was a huge fan of him at Tennessee. And the fact is, a lot of people are shocked he's the starter over a guy like Reed Sinek. But we'll see how it works out. We've seen some guys that people thought weren't going to be great end up being really solid. I mean, nobody expected Case Cookus to be as good as he was when Scott went down back in 2022. Is this a bit different? Yes, but we'll see. The fact is with the Roughnecks, though, of course, there's that question about Mark Thompson. Was his injury blown out of proportion? Because at least as of now, we still haven't heard anything that says he's going to be actually missing time officially. 
So we don't know for sure, which yes, if he is injured, that is a big deal and that probably lowers them maybe a spot. But the thing with that is this team now understands what they are without Mark Thompson. They didn't know that as well back in 2023, you know, under the new head coach, Curtis Johnson and all that. But now that they've played those two games and lost, they probably know a lot better what to do if he is out. But the fact is, and why they're six is because of the question mark at quarterback, is their receiving room is truly incredible. You've got Hall, you've got ARW, and you got Isaiah Henney. I think Isaiah Henney is still the most just least talked about big move during the offseason for any team. Look, you can, you know, dislike Curtis Johnson all you want. I've heard a lot of people say how he is the worst coach in the league and all that. Look, what he proved last year was he does know how to coach those wide receivers, and you gave him a true weapon in Isaiah Henney. That was a huge ad that I think nobody's really talking about. And, of course, this team is the defensive line. They cut a lot of great defensive linemen, and the reason they were able to do that is because of just how good it is. When you're talking about guys like Toby Johnson, Glenn Logan, Chris Odom, Adam Rodriguez, Sagapalu, Keontae Shad, Ethan Westbrooks, you're talking about Carlo Kemp. You're talking about basically all of these guys could start on almost any team. Only a couple of these guys probably wouldn't. Ethan Westbrooks, maybe not. But, I mean, look, Toby Johnson, Olive, and Keontae, one, if they're running a legit, you know, two defensive tackle, two defensive end scheme, one of those guys isn't starting. And any one of those three legitimately starts on any other team. That's how good the defensive line they have. Now, they took a huge hit when Manny Bunch retired. There was a huge shock to see that guy retire. A great safety for them. So their defense took a bit of a hit there. But when you have a defensive line like this, this is a team that if they make it to the playoffs can definitely make the championship run because they're going to be able to rely on defense. And if Mark Thompson is fully healthy, rely on him. The question is, can they make it to the playoffs though? Can they make it there? But as we've seen, even in the NFL team like the Pittsburgh Steelers, if you have a truly great defensive line, you can just sneak some wins away. Hell, if you look back in 2022 when Odom was there and all the guys that ended up leaving the gamblers back in the 2022 offseason, they were able to have the lead in almost every game during the season, basically just because of their defense. So this defense could carry them to wins. This is a team that I think a lot of people are underrating in a sense that I've seen people say they're like the worst or second worst team. I don't think they're that bad. It's just that they do have a huge question mark at quarterback that has to be addressed. Whether it is he does actually play well or they end up benching him for somebody else, we'll see. But they have the weapons to win. When you have a great offensive line, you have a great receiving room, you have a great running back room, you don't necessarily need a great quarterback. It's not like when you have like the DC defenders. They have a huge question mark because now they have a weaker receiver room, weaker tight end room, and weaker running back room, but they have a great quarterback, and it's what can he really do with talent that isn't so great. This is kind of the inverse, except the entire rest of the offense is really good, minus the QB. But we'll see. Rock next at six. Most surprising cut, Luis Aguilar. Look, no hate to J.J. Molson, but let's be real. A ton of people were shocked at Aguilar. I remember when I put him at, like, number two in my kicker ranking, everybody was like, oh my god, you didn't have him at one, that's crazy. And then he got released, so... You know, granted, I guess I maybe should have put him at 8, you know, hindsight. But the fact is, this is a guy that was really good. Yes, he got a bunch of hype because of his unbelievable game against the Generals, where he went 8 for 8 on field goals and single-handedly won the Stars the game. When you eliminate that game, he truly wasn't elite. I think that both Coughlin and Aubrey were better than him, but he still was an incredible kicker. The fact that he got released and still hasn't been picked up is a bit of a shock. This dude also can punt. And especially when you're talking about the UFL, which doesn't have as many roster spots, active roster spots as the NFL, having a guy that can do both kicking and punting duty and kickoff, it's a big deal. Very big shock that he got released. I would expect him to probably get signed during the season whenever we see a kicker, you know, start the season like, let's say, one of five or two of six. He probably gets the call and signs there. We'll see. This was definitely the most surprising cut. All USL kicker, kind of shocking. Now coming in at number 5 is going to be the Arlington Renegades. The defending XFL champions fall at number 5. Weird team. I know during some parts of the offseason, people had this team as low as number 8 and as high as like number 2. This is a team that has a, it's just, it's weird. Because the fact is that nobody really validates their championship run. Or no one really values it, the best way to put it. Their championship run this past season. Which, is pretty wild. Which, yes, is it true that Luis Perez had to play incredibly well during the postseason to get them the win? Yes. 
But we saw that with Alex Magoo, but nobody bat an eye because he did it during the regular season. The fact is that this team won the championship. Luis Perez is a truly great starting quarterback. Is he elite? No, he's not up there with like Case, AJ, and Jordan, but he's on that tier two of quarterbacks, a really good starter that can win you games. Of course, the re-signing of Sal Canelo was huge, and now they're basically this big three, Devion Smith, Sal Canelo, and Luis Perez. They have some question marks at the rest of the roster, because at the end of the day, to me, the reason this team is so hard to judge is because I don't really look at their roster and say, oh, wow, they're dominant there, but I don't look at any part and say, oh, wow, they're weak there. I mean, no offense to Renegade fans, but this team is like the quintessential mid. That's what they are. They are the mid team of the UFL. It's just, they have to win or lose multiple games in a row for me to look at them as anything other than mid. It's just, no what nobody on their roster truly gives me fear because even with Sal Canelo, who's a great tight end, you could easily make the case that he's the fourth best tight end in the league. That's nothing to scoff at, but fourth out of eight is technically mid. You know what I mean? Just like Luis Perez, great quarterback, but at best, he's fourth, mid. Devion Smith, great running back. Even with Abram Smith's injury, he's not top three. So, or he might be third, but probably fourth or fifth. So you know what I mean? It's just, none of these guys are bad on their team. It's just they're kind of mediocre. And even their cuts were like that. Look, their most surprising was Devin Darrington. This was a shocker. But even most of their cuts, I wasn't like, oh my god, I can't believe they released him. It's not like the Defenders or Stallions who released multiple incredible players. Look, Devin Darrington with Orlando, you no, know, a not that great team, with only a couple other, you know, decent players like Dormaday and Latimer, was able to have almost 300 yards on the ground in only seven games. Him getting released was a shock. As I've talked about before, I don't think this is a guy that can really start anywhere, but this is a guy that would be a true quality second back on a bunch of teams. I'm kind of shocked he hasn't been signed yet, but again, I think a lot of teams are kind of set on their roster, barring like a true huge player to them. So it is kind of what it is with him. Again, the release was very shocking because I true I do feel like he is better than anyone else that Arlington has in their roster once you get past Smith. But trust in Bob Stoops if you're a Renegades fan. Hope that he's correct. Go with Darrington. Getting cut is a good thing. I think it was surprising. Coming in at number four is going to be the DC Defenders. This one shouldn't be a shock to you guys. I said it during the Abram Smith video that that injury is going to move them down multiple spots. They move down to number four. Now again, this is multiple spots because, you know, the last Power Rankings video I did was based on the roster in a weird way, but I used to, I had him at two essentially, you know, if you saw the video, you understand what I'm talking about. The fact is, is that this team did fall down multiple spots because of the Abram Smith injury. I was going to put him at two in this video, but with it, they dropped down to four. The reason is their offense is just, it's just very, very, very questionable. If you're a Defenders fan, you are worried about that offense. You're hoping a lot of things click. Hope Kiki Cootie ends up, you know, living up to the hype he had when he got signed here. Hoping the receiving room can elevate. Hoping a running back can replace Smith. At the end of the day, if you're looking at this purely from a UFL lens, you don't think of anything else any of these players have done. You're looking at it saying you have a great quarterback, a solid offensive line, and that's your offense. Questionable at every other position. How much can Tayamo actually do with that team? Yes, Tayamu was considered the best quarterback in the XFL by the XFL Awards since they didn't have an MVP and he won Offensive Player of the Year, which arguably should have gone Abram Smith. I digress. Abram Smith was the reason this team was truly dominant this past season. Tayamu was great, but Abram Smith is the guy that ended up... I mean, he obliterated the league in rushing yards, okay? This wasn't even close. He obliterated the entire rest of the league. He was the guy that really made this team click. Tayamu was a bit shaky in the playoffs, and that was a huge difference maker of why they didn't win the championship. Whereas Smith basically always was really solid. Aside from like his game against the Dragons, remember, he was just kind of there. But his championship game, he was solid. But the reason this team is fourth and above the rest is because their defense is still really solid. Look, mainly their front seven is just really solid. Yes, is it a bit questionable that there's only six defensive linemen? Sure, but of course, as everybody knows, outside linebackers, a lot of them are basically just defensive ends. And even then, you've got a really solid group. Trent Harris, elite. Reggie Northrup, really good. Davin Bellamy, elite. Then your defensive backs. You do have a guy like Deontay Anderson, a really, really good player. And a lot of other solid defensive backs. This is a really good defense. I'd say this is definitely in the top four best defenses in the league. And considering the fact that a lot of these defenses are really good, that is actually saying something. This defense is truly great, and it's going to be a huge reason why this team is good. Essentially, I compare them to the Roughnecks, and it's that sense of, basically, this is proof of why quarterback matters, because even though I think that the rest of the defense, aside from the D-line, is probably a bit better with the defenders, 
It's not a ton. The Roughnecks do have Reuben Foster on them. So there is a legit argument that the Roughnecks are right behind them, which is crazy to some people, but it's true when you actually look at it. But we'll see. Jordan Tayamu is an elite quarterback, and that is why they get the benefit of the doubt over the Roughnecks, who the Roughnecks as a whole do have a better roster at this point due to injuries and what we've seen guys do. But when you have Reggie Barlow as your head coach, you have Jordan Tayamu as your quarterback, that elevates you to a much higher degree than saying you have Garantino as your quarterback and Curtis Johnson as your head coach. You see what I mean? That's a huge reason why this team is number four, the Roughnecks are number six. So that's why they're there. Now, the most surprising cut was obviously Boogie Roberts. Yes, Tim Ward was a big shock, but the fact is Boogie Roberts was a dude who was truly great both seasons, especially this past one. Well, the first year he was just a good player, like a, you know, a really solid one, but this past season he was truly great. Eight TFLs was one of the highest in the league. He had 32 tackles, three sacks. He was a monster for them. And as we talked about when he first got drafted there, this is a dude that also is great as just a publicity type of guy. So seeing him get released was a big shock. And him not signing anywhere when teams... There are multiple teams that do need him, whether teams that have very few defensive tackles, which we'll get to one very shortly, or a team like the Panthers who have overall weaker ones. This was a shock. I'm really shocked he hasn't signed anywhere. This is a really solid player. But... You know, sometimes that's kind of what happens. These good players end up getting overlooked because, you know, they're not the right fit or because they're not, you know, incumbent players. A big shock, definitely the most shocking defender cut. Now, coming in at number three is going to be the Memphis Showboats. The Showboats are number three. I think a lot of people, I saw like a power rankings that was posted on Reddit or something where they had them at like six and I was like, what are you talking about? Look, the Showboats are a really good team. Look, if you are an XFL fan purely, then you then I understand why you don't look at this team as great. But if you actually watched both leagues, you know this team is scary. Why are these five players on your screen, you may be asking. That is because if you were to do what I would call a big five of an offense, they have the best big five of the entire league. There's no argument. Like, this is one of the few times I would say there is no argument. They have the best big five in the league. Now, what I mean by big five is I mean your best offensive lineman, Jerron Jones, your best tight end, Sage Sherratt, your best receiver, Jay Adams, your best running back, Darius Victor, your best quarterback, Case Cookus. No other team comes close. Look, the Battlehawks are great, but then once you hit them with the tight end and running back, the showboat's clear. Quarterback, very close. AJ versus Case, basically, whoever you ask, they're going to say they like which one better. Jay Adams versus Jacor Pearson or Hakeem Butler, if you want to go by the injury. I'd give that one to Hakeem or Jacor. Wayne Gallman versus Darius Victor. Do I want the guy that is new to spring football and is old, or do I want the older running back that has played spring football and has been elite? Darius Victor. Offensive linemen, they're close, but Jerron Jones has been a two-time All-USL player. He gets the edge. Tight end, come on, Jake Sutherland versus Sage Sherratt, it's not even close. You can do this with any other team. This is the best. The issue and the reason they're down here at three and not above the Battle Hawks is because they just kind of don't have the depth some other teams do. And, and, and even that's not the correct word. It's just something about their roster, mainly their defense, kind of questions me and makes me go, I don't know about them. Yes, they have a really solid backup to Sage. They have a great quarterback room all in all. Troy Williams is one of the best backups in the league. Trey Williams as your backup running back is great. They have an overall good receiving core. Didn't even mention Vinny Papel. But the issue is that their defense is just kind of questionable. Like, you have some really high-end talented guys. And yes, I know a lot of people are looking at, like, the DJ Daniel release and saying if that guy got released, then they must have a lot of faith in their DBs. I don't know. It's just their defense concerns me a bit. And of course, this offense does need to gel. But when you're talking about talent-wise, this is the most talented Big Five in the league. These are all elite players at their position. No other team is this elite. Even the Stallions, for how good a roster they have, they don't have a quarterback that matches Case Cookus. And so when you look at it like that, or even a receiver that matches Jay Adams, I don't think anyone would say they do. So it's just incredible. So if you were to put this team at two, I'd understand it. If you put them at four or five and you say it's because you don't know how they're going to gel, sure. But they upgraded a head coach with John Filippo over Todd Haley. They upgraded their quarterback. They upgraded their running back room. They upgraded basically everywhere to a level that very few teams are able to do as a whole. So I put them at three. As for their most surprising cut, it is Derek Dillon. Derek Dillon was easily their most surprising release of all of them. The fact is that while this team had multiple shocking ones, like I mentioned DJ Daniel, Derek Dillon was an a special teams player of the year winner. This is a big shock. Look, this is a dude who's a really good receiver, 340 yards and only 28 receptions. He had 1,100 all-purpose yards that led the entire USFL despite only playing in nine games. 
And his 750 kick return yards were up there for the most, but he had multiple kick return TDs. He also had the like field goal, if I'm not mistaken, that he return, returned for 109 yards. This is a really great guy. The fact that he got released is a huge shock, though it does scream that he didn't fit with the roster or he didn't fit with Filippo's coaching philosophy. That's what makes this kind of make sense because this is a dude that on paper is one of the best at what he does. Look, especially when you're keeping the USFL kickoff, you'd expect teams to go after the best USFL kickoff guy considering he won special teams player of the year because of his great kick return ability. So seeing him not get picked up is a huge shock. This is a dude that's a really solid receiver. He's not a number one receiver, but this is a really solid second or third receiver type of guy and is a great returner. There's a lot of teams that could utilize this guy to a high degree. I'd assume he gets signed. Maybe it's something like Manny Bunch will find out later that he know he might retire or something. I don't know for sure. But again, this is a huge shock. Definitely the most surprising cut for the showboats. Now coming in at number two is going to be the St. Louis Battlehawks. The Battlehawks move up a decent amount of spots. And this is mainly because of the Abram Smith injury. And because of the fact that they kind of just... They also had one really solid signing. When you look at this team, the first thing you notice is the wide receiver room. Look, this is not even with Jacor Pearson. If you're wondering why he's not there, it's because he's on the IR, even though he is expected to return during the season. Even without him, this is crazy. Like, this is a really good receiving room, right? Darius Shepard, Akeem Butler, Blake Jackson. Oh my goodness. That's without Jacor Pearson. That's insane. Then you look at him, they have a really good DB room. Look, they got Lavert Hill, all XFL cornerback, and they signed all USFL cornerback Channing Stribling, who got released from the Stallions, mainly because the Stallions had just a ton of DBs. They signed him immediately. He's made the roster. So this is a potential duo at corner that's one of the best in the league. Then you have the DPOY. They were the team that were able to get Pita. He was a really good player on the Vipers. One of the few guys in the Vipers that was, you know, good. He was one of them. He was an all XFL player, defensive player of the year for the Vipers. And they were able to get him, the Battlehawks. So the fact they were able to get that type of guy to add to their defense, because their defense is a very high-end talent group. There are multiple all XFL players on there. The depth is a bit concerning, but it is an overall solid starting group. Then their offense, as we've talked about before, their running back room and tight end room is where their weakness lies. Granted, the running back room is purely based on how well Wayne Gallman translates. If he translates well to the UFL, it's not a weakness. If he doesn't translate well, it is a weakness. And their tight end room is a weakness. But their receiving room, incredible. A.J. McCarron, at worst, he's the third best quarterback in the league. That's at worst. So when your quarterback is, at worst, the third best, and at best, the best quarterback in the league, that's a good thing. So, huge reason for them to be number two. There's not really a ton to talk about with this team. It's just, they have a defense that, while I don't think is one of the best, it has a lot of high-end talent that can, you know, be really good, and your offense is overall just really solid. I mean, or it's, it's let me rephrase that. They're elite at certain areas, weak at other areas, overall a really good unit. Now, their most surprising release was Kevin Atkins. Look, this team has, like, very few defensive tackles on their roster, so it makes it even more questionable why you got rid of a dude who was a stalwart at the DT position for you last season. Yes, he doesn't pop out in the stat sheets. 14 tackles, one sack. But this is a dude who understands the system, was here, and it just was very shocking to see him get released. Look, the Battlehawks really didn't have any super surprising cuts, but this one was probably the most surprising because, again, this is a really solid player. Is he elite? No. But he's a guy that fits what your team needed. Now you have a deficiency, not a weakness, but a deficiency at the defensive tackle position. And so, why release Atkins? He helps that group. Now, if you're going to go out there and sign a Boogie Roberts, then yes, I understand why you release Kevin Atkins. But they haven't done that as of recording this video. So as of the time of recording this video, you now have a deficiency that you made yourself that gives a weakness to your defense. You are allowing running backs a much better chance to get through that first wave of defenders at the defensive line. And yes, it doesn't matter if you have great linebackers. You're still weakening the front end of your defense. It's a front seven, right? It's not a middle three. So you're weakening the front four of your front seven. That's a very, very questionable move. So this was definitely the most surprising cut. Now coming in at number one is the Birmingham Stallions. I mean, who else was it going to be? Look, I don't have to explain this. I just have to show the roster. Can you really look at anywhere on this team and go, oh, that's a weakness? CJ Maribel has been the most underrated running back in either league, basically since year one when Bo Scarborough came in and played incredible during that, like, you know, back third of the season. The receiving room, they cut a couple of guys. They lost a couple. They still have 
Marlon Williams, Isaiah Zuber, and Deion Kane. They have Jay Sternberger, arguably the best tight end in the league. They have a really good offensive line. They were able to cut all USL players on that offensive line because of how well they believe it's going to be. Chris Blewett, even if you you know are pessimistic about him, he's still a solid kicker. Colby Wadman, great putter. They're the DBs. Mark Gilbert, incredible. Jojo Tillery, really solid. A couple other great players as well. Your linebackers, they got DeMarcus Gates back. Again, one of the more underappreciated moves nobody's talking about. He was insane in 2022, and now he's back. You have Keava Tizino, was one of the best linebackers this past season. Scooby Wright, win healthy, really good. Your defensive line, you signed Taco Charlton out of nowhere. If he's able to, you know, go back to playing at a level that is why he was a first-round pick in the NFL, oh my gosh. Look, this team is just, it, it's just the best. Until this team loses... There's no way to argue they're not the number one team. That's what the Stallions have built. When you win back-to-back championships, when you lose in two seasons what other teams lose in the first half of a single season, you're in a class by yourself. I mean, by themselves. They are the number one team. And to me, the difference from one to two versus, like, when I did the first rankings, when I had them at one and the defenders at two to one here to the two of the Battlehawks, it's a lot bigger than before. Look, could this team go out and shock everybody by losing? Sure. If that happens, then they fall. But until they lose, you have to have them at number one. There is no argument for any other team to be above them. And you get that right to be that way when you win back-to-back championships and you make it look easy. The New Orleans Breakers, you could legitimately argue, were the second best team in spring football. Better than the Renegades better than the Defenders, better than the Maulers, who the Stallions beat in the championship, you could argue they were the second-best team in spring football with how loaded their roster was at high-end talent. MBT, Wes Hills, Sage Surratt, that defense, and they obliterated them in the playoff game. This Stallions team is insane. Look, Alex Ngu was great last year, but everybody forgets that the year prior, Jamar Smith was truly on course to potentially be MVP, Then he got, like, sick and minor injuries. He played a bit bad during the last third of the season. But this team with Jamar is still a great team. If Matt Crowell's the starter, you're having a guy that was a third-round pick just a couple years ago. This is a great team, great roster. They're number one. Look, their most surprising cut, I had multiple choices at who could be that one. I mean, there were multiple guys that I could pick. And I ended up picking Andre St. Amore. I mean... Channing Stribling, as I mentioned, Hercules Matafa was another great player, but I went on Ray no more because I looked at it and I said, you know what, he's probably the best player they released. This is a dude that in both 22 and 2023 was a great player. He took a step up in 23, you know, without Davin Bellamy being there, you know, be a bodster up front. He was able to pick up some of that slack by getting up four more sacks than he did the previous year. But this is a dude who, across the two seasons, had at least seven TFLs, at least 30 tackles, and at least two sacks both seasons. That's pretty solid. That's a really good number. And I would be shocked if he doesn't sign with the Showboats in the next couple of days. I mean, as of right now, I haven't heard anything about it. But again, this is the dude that should go to the Showboats or the Roughnecks. He can either reunite with Keontae Shad in Houston or he could, you know, reunite with John Filippo in Memphis. I wouldn't be shocked either way. If he stays unsigned, then I would be shocked. This is a dude that's a really solid player. But again, when you have the roster the Stallions do... You're able to make a release like this and not really be that shocking. Look, I mean, Victor Bowen Jr. kind of just disappeared out of nowhere from the roster page. We still don't know what's up with him. And even that's not that big a loss because their team didn't really need him last year when he was gone. So this team, they're the best. This is the most surprising cut. Great player, but it's not really that surprising he got released. It's just that he was the best player to get released by them. So it is what it is. So overall, that'll do it for my week one UFL power rankings. Let me know down in the comments what you think, what your power rankings are yourselves. Do you agree or disagree with some of mine, and why do you agree or disagree with them? Do you think I was right about each team's most surprising cut? Let me know down below what you want me to do for next week's, you know, extracurricular thing, whether you want me to do, like, you know, each team's best signing, each team's best player in week one and all that. Let me know down below. As always, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell to be notified if you any videos because we have the week one game picks coming out in just a couple days so be on the lookout for that if you want to become a channel member get exclusive video every month about a non-ufl sport make sure that you
become a member. There's a link down below and the join button as low as $1 a month as well as a few other perks. And as always, have a great night.